Well, good afternoon. How are you? Well, we started a series last week called Nobody Stands Alone, and we believe that. Uh, we think that this is a journey we need to do together. God has planned it that way, and we certainly hope that uh, you will be blessed. God would open up your mind, your understanding, and areas that He wants to speak to you in. And that, uh, if you're joining us online, we're glad uh, for you to be with us, and we hope for that as well. Well, I want to uh, bring up a calendar. This is, uh, as you can see, uh, I have August 28th circle. That was yesterday. But as you can see from the year, it's yesterday 40 years ago. That's the day that I asked Jesus Christ into my life. So it's a 40-year anniversary. Important date for me, certainly. Um, uh, you know, but it was kind of an interesting story of how that happened. Uh, my brother, my older brother, had been away on a uh, some kind of college uh, job thing, and he had come to Christ three weeks before this time. And he came and he said, hey, Andy, I want to meet with you. It was a Friday night. Goes, uh, you know, let me read this little book. Somebody had given him a book. He didn't know anything. He had just given his life to Christ three weeks earlier. So he reads through this Peace with God book with me, and, at the, and it tells me about how God loves me how he sent his son Jesus Christ to die for me and how that that's a free gift of salvation that God will give me power for a living. Uh, he'll forgive my sin. All I need to do is pray to ask him into my life. Well, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I, I'm smart enough to know a good deal when I hear one. Yeah. I thought, wow, that's incredible. I can just ask Christ into my life right now and I'm going to get all that. He said, absolutely. So I prayed to receive Christ. And I said, well, now what? And he goes, well, now, he goes, I was hoping you'd do that. He goes, I have a gram of cocaine that we can do. Because uh, we were like drug addicts, you know. If you're wondering, you know, like that, that's how that, it was, in other words, that's the stuff we were doing just previous. And he goes, and I've got incredible pot, you know. And back in the day, it was sense of me and buds. I don't keep up with it now, so I don't know all the, you know, but back then it was tie stick and all that. So he pulls this great weed out, and, and we go up and get the best beer we could buy. And we said, so the night I came to Christ, I'm doing lines, smoking from a bong, getting blitz, wasted out of my head. And I, I'm, praise God, you know, God is good, you know. And, and you know, Jesus is, I'm, thank you, Lord, you know, because I didn't know any better. Now, he also gave me this little green New Testament. He said, you should read this. Uh, you know, and it was hard to read because it was King James, and I think Proverbs and Psalms was in there, and and so I I was going into college myself, and so you know I would I, I worked my way through school, so I would work and I'd go to class and I'd study, and at the end of each day, I usually like to get wasted, and so I'd get my bong out, I'd just get blitzed out of my head, and then open up the Green New Testament. I thought I'll read some Bible now, you know. So that, if you're worried about my theology today, that was the roots where it came from. You know, that was my humble beginnings. <laughs> and, you know, honestly, it didn't really change for like two years. I mean, I just, you know, I was dropping acid and sleeping around. And, I mean, I just, I, my, there was no behavioral change in my life for about two years because I didn't know anything about church and I couldn't really understand the Bible and so somebody finally just said, hey, if you're, you're a Christian, you should consider going to church. I, I don't know about that. Are you sure? Isn't that just filled with hypocrites? Some things never change, right? That's the, but eventually I took a chance. I thought, you know, I'll go to church and see what it's like. And next thing you know, I found out there are people like me just trying to work, just trying to figure out how life works and how God can impact their life and change it for the better. And then I got involved in a small group. And then the big changes that really happened in my life were all from a small group. That's where I found life. That's where I found the ability to really step out and gain strength from people around me. And that's what we want to talk about. That's the series. Certainly that's today. I came across this interesting author, a guy named uh, uh, William Boyles, here it is, uh, and he was a Vietnam vet. He wrote a book and he talked about some of his experiences and I really thought it was interesting how he talked about the emotional, mental, and, and, and support he got from his platoon. Here's what he says. A part of me, kind of a surprising statement, loved war. 
He goes, now please understand, I'm a peaceful man, fond of children and animals, and I believe that war should have no place in the affairs of men. But the comradeship our platoon experienced in that war provides an enduring and moving memory in me. He goes, a comrade in war is someone you can trust with anything because you regularly trust him with your life. In war, individual position, possessions and advantages count for nothing. He goes, the group, the unit, the platoon is everything. He goes on to explain how they shared rice rations and, and, and bunks and cots. And they, uh, they, if they had one cigarette, they would share that one cigarette and pass it around. He says, in war, we regularly risked our lives in recovery of, the wound, of our wounded and dead. We often felt close enough to each other to call one another brothers. And then reflecting on um, this comradeship, he said, a part of me loved war. A part of me loved war. Charles Murray, who was a, is a, a sociologist, picked up this theme of this idea of groups that there, something happens dynamic in a small group, little platoons, and he says, sociologically, that's something you can see. He said, we each belong to a few little platoons. These, these little platoons tend to form around commonly held, held values. It is a human tendency to seek out people who share our particular values or interests, and once we identify some people who treasure what we hold dear, then we just tend to link up with them primarily for the purpose of protecting or enhancing the mutually shared values. Now, that's not just a sociological truth, which it is. It's a spiritual truth. We need one another. There's something that happens in a little platoon, as he refers to it, that happens in the Christian community where we link up with one another. We draw something special. You know, there's about half of the countries in the world it is very hard to be a Christ follower. Uh, you can end up being persecuted terribly, put into a concentration, some kind of a, a labor camp is what they're calling them, right? Uh, the, you know, or even death. And there's Christians, including in Afghanistan, that still will go to great lengths to still meet together. They'll find little caves. They'll find uh, barrios, maybe in a room. They'll travel at night. They'll travel long distances all to be together because there's something powerful that happens when Christ followers come together. We get support from one another. We encourage one another. There's accountability. There's love. There's wisdom. There's inspiration. Certainly there's account. There's a, there's a challenge that happens. All those things are so important. And so we want to talk about you know, how, how can we make that more part of our life? Because if, God, if, if God's going to have his full spiritual potential unleashed into your life, it's going to involve people. It's not a solo thing. And maybe you've already figured this out. Here's what the Bible says. It says, as Christ's soldier, do not let yourself become tied up in worldly affairs. There's a lot of things that can distract us in this world. He says, for then you cannot satisfy the one who has enlisted you into his army. So when I asked Christ into my life 40 years ago, uh, certainly there was a decision on my end, which is important, and I'm glad I did, but I was actually enlisted. God's saying, I want you to be part of my army. I have an assignment for you, and it's going to be part of a group. You're not, it's not a solo thing. You're part of a group. And so that is what we see time and time and time again in Scripture. Notice here it says in the early church, when the church was just forming, it said they met day after day in the temple courts and from house to house. So you had the large church gathering, which met in the temple courts. But then you also had the meeting daily, all throughout the week, in homes, in small groups, or these little platoons, these little platoons. And so we see especially in the book of Acts, uh, as they describe small group activity, we see characteristics. And those characteristics are found in our small groups. If you get involved in a small group, which I certainly hope you do, you'll find some of these characteristics. Some of our small groups have all 10. We're just going to quickly go over it. Just, just they have all 10. Some have less. All of them have at least one characteristic. I'll show you which one that is. First of all, Bible study. Bible study is so important because we inject God's wisdom into things. And, and sometimes we actually have 
uh, you know, our, our, our mobile phone open, our, our, our paper Bible, and we're reading it. Other times it's happening through encouragement, through, uh, you know, what God's doing in our lives. But we do have that in, in our small groups, and it happens in a, in, in, a, in a pattern throughout the small group. We see that over and over. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So what they did is, you know, Peter or somebody would get up, James would start speaking, and uh, and the temple courts, and then they would talk about it later in the week. Hey, what do you think about what James said? What, what about Peter said? You know, and, and that's that's the natural rhythm. See, and in our church, we have a rhythm where we meet for thirteen weeks, then we take some time off, then we meet again for six weeks, then we take time off. Here's what it looks like. We talk about this in growth track. That we have 13 weeks, then six weeks, then 13 weeks. That way, there's natural on-ramps, natural off-ramps. Anything healthy has rhythm to it. And so we want to have a, something that's sustainable for you. That it's not just constantly going, but it's also, you know, not something that you're never part of. And so we feel like this works out well so that we can have a church that grows in the area of go, growing in God's Word. More than just on weekends but throughout the weeks. And then number two is fellowship. Fellowship is the Bible's word for relationships, building in our relationships. It says they devoted one, oh, each other to fellowship. Here's a good description. It says all the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other. Amen. What do you share? Well, there's different things you can share, but you know, the primary thing we share is ourselves. We, we share ourselves, the real you. So often, most of us have very few people that, you know, that we can share the real us. We're good at wearing masks, and partly because we have to, right? People will hurt us. People will misunderstand us, and so we keep a mask on. I'm up here on, the, on, on Sunday to encourage you. So if I'm going through something that's discouraging, that's, you know, where do I share that? You know, I have things I, I go through that you don't know about. And I'm not going to tell you, right? It's, it's, it's my stuff, right? But I need to tell somebody. I need to be in a group where other people can hear what I'm going through. And certainly, you need that as well. The first thing Jesus did when he started his ministry was he got some people together. Twelve guys formed a small group, a little platoon. Because he knew that that's where he was modeling for that, but he was also doing it because those guys needed it as well. Support, training, encouragement, all that's so important. Number three is communion. And we do communion on Sundays, but uh, not every week. If you, part of what we do is in, we do communion in our small groups, just like they did uh, back in the day. It says small groups in homes doing communion. You know, the first 250 years of Christianity, there were no big church buildings people met in. It was always in small groups. And that's why communion, actually, that word means, is a Greek word, koinonia. It means fellowship. It means it's something you do in community. It's something, there's something bigger than just uh, do, of celebrating the, the actual sacrament or whatever you want to call it we tend to be very individualistic, so we tend to think of it, oh, this is just between me and God. Well, actually, communion is actually something we do in homes. And so we've authorized and blessed all of our small group leaders to lead communion. We've taught them if they needed to. We've said do it as much as you and your group want to. Number three, number four is prayer. Prayer. Prayer is an integral part of a small group. They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, I mentioned to you, we have some groups that do all ten, some groups that do, most groups just do some of those. Every group, we've asked all of our small group leaders to always pray, no matter what kind of group. I don't, we don't care if it's, you know, a group where, because we have groups that like, you know, do exercise and any group, at least take a moment and pray. And so that's a part of it. And then Holy Spirit power. You know, if you start praying and you start believing, God's going to move. And some amazing things happen, and we see that in the New Testament. It says a deep sense of holy awe swept over everyone, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. That will happen. And when, if you want to see God move in your life, get other people praying for you, and you be praying for them. Now, when God moves, and you go tell somebody, we live in a pretty skeptical society. If you go tell people at work, oh, yeah, there's a miracle happened to me. Most people, you know, their reaction is, they roll their eyes, right? Like, oh, no. 
you know, that, you know, there you go again. But if they know you, they know what you're going through. That changes everything. Sharon and I, went, we had a hard time having kids at first when we first got married. Had some, some uh, miscarriages. And finally we had, uh, Sharon got pregnant. We got into the, you know, the, the, the uh, second trimester with, this, with, with, our, with our son. And then at 18 weeks, the doctor goes, oh, unfortunately, this one is a misfire also. You know, the, you, we might as well abort him because he's going to, he's so, it's all messed up. He's going he's gonna to die. So we chose not to take that advice. We thought, well, we're going to see what God does. Amen. But she was on bed rest for, for the length from that point on, from eight, week 18 all the way to week 40. We, had a, we were uh, in a uh, two-story house, so we had to bring her bed down. I mean, she, was, she couldn't even go upstairs. Bed rest, full bed rest. Our small group was praying with us, encouraging us. They knew what we were going through. Each week, we would go to, and the doctor would give us a negative report, and we'd report it into the small group, and they would be praying for us. When God healed our son, who is Samuel, he's on, he's on staff with us at, at, at this church. When he healed everybody, now, of course, the doctor's office, they knew what was going on, too. And he was a Jewish guy, and he knew what we were praying. And so when he saw the healing happen, right at the very end, he, he wouldn't even tell us. He goes, stay right here. He ran away. He ran into the foyer, brought in all of the staff, because they all knew our story. Brought them all in. He goes, I, I guess this is what you guys call a miracle. <laughs> and he, then he showed us the monitor. You know, but, but our small group leaders, I mean, our small group knew as well. I mean, they were walking with us through that difficult journey. And, uh, and it's, the miraculous can happen, though, certainly. And, uh, and I love A.W. Tozer. He says, as far as the New Testament is concerned, it's not the Holy Spirit and power. It's the Holy Spirit as power. Yeah. That is God, God. When God's around, things are happening. Then there's generosity. Generosity is stirred up. When we know what somebody's going through, when they lose a job, when they have child care issues, when, they, when they're ill and they need somebody to rally around and bring them, you know, meals like we've been doing for a few people this last few weeks because they've had, you know, the real bad case of COVID. I mean, that's where it happens in, the, in some of the most beautiful form. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, as, and they gave that to everyone. I, I just wanted to point that as out because sometimes people read this verse and they think, oh, well, that's like um, socialism or communism. No, no. He says it, it was their possessions. And, and then they gave out of what was their own personal property. Another great verse is when Peter is talking to Ananias. He was going to sell something and give it. He goes, he goes, while it, referring to his property, while it remained... Was it not your own? He goes, that was your own personal property. Even after you sold it, was not the money your own. Even the proceeds, the profits. He goes, that was yours. That was, so it's not, it certainly is not promoting, you know, socialism. In fact, it's promoting pro this idea of private property. That this was, and that's what, that's what makes generosity. It's not public goods that's taken from you. It's, it's yours. And then you give. And that's a demonstration of generosity. Number seven is social gatherings, coming together. And to me, synonymous with social gatherings is food, right? Good food. Coming to, I mean, if somebody invites me over, usually might, I might say something about me, right? But my, one of my first questions is, what are we having? You know, I mean, you know, what, what, what kind of food? They broke bread, which is bigger than just bread. I mean, if you read those passages like 1 Corinthians 11, breaking bread is a meal in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And listen, if you're eating and you're glad about it, it's good food, yeah. right? That's good food. That's a, that's a good sign. And that's what we ask our small groups to do is, is bring good food. Bring your best stuff. You know, if you're a small group host, don't like hide the good stuff. You know, and you're thinking, well, we got to show up with something. You know, what about that stew that's, is that off yet? Let's check. And you open it up. It'll last a day. Small groups tomorrow. We'll just bring this, right? I mean, we don't do that. Nobody's going to be glad that you brought a stew that if it doesn't get eaten today, it's, you know, it's, it's going off. So we, you know, we, 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 hey, this is important to us. And so we, we, we want to we wanna bless people with our very best. Praise is another thing that can often be in song. It can just be in a joyful attitude, certainly. 
It says they were praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And so prayer, I mean praise and, and, and joy and, and all the things that when we start thinking about what God you know, is doing for us and what he does for us, it changes our attitude. Outreach, outreach is, is we're always wanting more people to come. Now, many of our small groups, most of our small groups are open groups. In other words, you can come at any time during the semester. Some of them, like our freedom group, it gets closed after a week or two because they're going somewhere with that. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. But a lot of them are open groups, open groups. And, and so I've told all of our small group leaders that anybody who is here in the church that right now, and if you're not in a small group, you're fair game for them. They're going to, I say, go looking for them. Go ask them. Encourage them to be part of your small group. So you can, ex- you know, you know, you can certainly expect that to come your way because we want you in our small groups. We believe in them. We believe that all of us do better when we are doing it together. It says, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so, part, you know, if they were only meeting on, on Sundays, it wouldn't say they were added daily, right? It would be added weekly. The only way you can do it da- daily is it through small groups, through small groups. People coming, people getting involved, and people uh, coming to know God. Lastly is leadership development. Leadership development. God's all about us growing up, us maturing, us taking our next step. And in most cases, that involves more responsibility, helping out in different ways that we weren't doing before, stretching ourselves in areas that maybe, you know, makes us a little uncomfortable. It's leadership development. Jesus said we should be praying that workers that are to, to bring in the harvest. And he's talking about leadership development. You know, Paul had a, a, a small a cadre of, 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 you know, a small platoon, a, his own platoon, Timothy, Silas, Luke, and he's writing to Timothy, and he says, and all that you've learned from me, still in, that, in that platoon that they had, confirmed by the integrity of my life, because they were close to him, they knew what he was saying, deposit that in faithful leaders. So we're always looking to deposit stuff and raise people up. God's, you know, healthy things in life, healthy things in life, multiply. That's a sign of health, that it multiplies. So if you're in a small group, particularly if it's bigger, like 10 or 12 or, you know, 14 people, or, it, your group is pregnant. <laughs> it's pregnant with, with new leadership, with hosts, with people that can do stuff, and we hold on loosely because God gives growth, and we don't want to hold back what God wants to do. So we help, hey, go, you know, be part of the multiplication of what we're all doing here. You know, when Jesus handpicked his disciples, his little platoon, it's not like he just drew a line and said, anybody, you know, the first 12 across get to be in my group. No, he handpicked them, right? Mark says that he prayed all night, thinking about who should be on my group. Paul, you certainly see the same, you know, the same uh, uh, thoughtfulness in bringing his group together. Well, it's true for us. I showed you the 10 characteristics of, group, of, of small groups. Those are important to know. But what's equally important to know is how do you really select a small group that gets together, that, that does well together? Because it would be naive for us to think that just because you love the Lord, that's all you need. It's just, it's just not that simple. We are wired differently. We have different things going on in our lives. So what are the things that you need to be looking for when you're joining a small group? Well, how to select platoon candidates. First is affinity. In other words, there should be some shared commonality. There's, you should like being around the people you're, you're going to be spending time with them. You're going to be doing life with them. All the believers were together and had everything in common. So affinity. What's affinity? Well, we click. We mesh. It's life-giving. It's, they're interesting people. They're, I get energized when I'm around them. All those things are are um, indicators that there is affinity. Affinity. Affinity is, is an interesting thing because it can really supersede and transcend the laws of homogeneity, things that we would normally think we need to get along with somebody. 
In other words, I need to be around the same age and have the same background, have the same political view. I mean, we have all these little things we think that's what I need. But honestly, affinity uh, transcends all of that. If, if, if people, they can be quite different than you, different age, different temperament, and you can, you can be energized around them, be like being around them. And, and I think if you read between the lines with Jesus, did he like his 12 disciples? I think you'd say, yeah, he liked them. Well, there's one that was on the bubble, right? Judas, he didn't do too good. But, but I think you'd say he liked him. He liked his inner circle, you know, of, of Peter, James, and John. He enjoyed being with them. Paul, I think if you read between the lines, you see he liked being with Luke, with Timothy, with Silas. So that's an important part is this idea of affinity. There's a sameness. Secondly is intensity. Now, in the New Testament, they were intense. I mean, they're all in, says, selling their possessions. And goods. I mean, if you go to a small group this week and right out of the gate they say, we're going to sell most of what we own and give it away, you know you're an intense group, right? You think, okay, this is, this is intense. But you have to decide, do I want to be in that level of intensity? Because not everybody does well with that level of intensity. We've had in the past where, you know, 10 or 12 people will get together and they all love the Lord. They all want to grow. They all want discipleship. But after about a month or so, somebody, you know, says, hey, listen, I'm wondering, when are we going to take the gloves off? When are we going to start pushing one another and challenging one another? And even if it hurts, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of blood. You know, let's, you know, rip open some stuff and let's go to town. And there's other people in the small group thinking, I hope never. I hope that never happens. That's not what I signed up for. I like... Just small conversation in the waiting room. Keep me out of the OR. You know, I don't want to go to the operating room, and I don't want to be traumatized and rotorootered every time, every week I show up. I just didn't sign up for that. All right, so you have different, and different, different expectations, different levels of intensity. Years ago when the church was younger, we had never had a softball team before, and we thought, well, let's, let's, do a, let's do a church softball team. So we rallied one together, and what we discovered was people had different levels of intensity. <laughs> you, I mean, there was balls that would get hit, and our people, some of our people were like in the, in the, in the uh, outfield, and the ball, they, they were talking, so they didn't even see it. You know, they're talking with the bird, and the ball just, boom, bloop, rolls over, and they're, oh, sorry, you know. <laughs> And there was other people on the team that that was, that was not okay. I mean, they were going, don't you understand? You've got to dive for those balls. <laughs> and the, they're thinking, what is this, the World Series of softball or something? I, I work all day. I'm just here to enjoy myself. And, and anyways, it, it was a clash. It didn't work well. So we learned. So the next time that we played softball, we decided two teams is what we needed. Two teams. And we told them up front, this is a recreational team. You can be surfing your social media if you want during, you know, in the outfield or wherever, you know what I mean? And have your coffee with your glove and, you know, just, it's, it's, it's that kind of group. And everybody's going to be okay with that. And then the other group, we said, oh, this is high competitive softball. You, it's all about winning. That's all that matters. And, uh, you know, and, and, and we did, and there, and there was people with that level of intensity. They showed up with their knee pads and their athletic supporters and their eye gear to protect them, protective eye gear. And I mean, they were all in. And then at, on the Sundays that after the games, one of the, if one of those people showed up with like a broken arm, you know, something's in a sling, they've got, you know, a cast, that was a badge of honor. Everybody go, wow, that is awesome. You went all out, man. You went all out. Well, so I tell you that to show you that there's different temperaments. There's different, listen, both are valid. And when you're in a small group, some of you, you want just a more measured, paced pathway towards your discipleship and your spiritual growth. That is fine. Others of you, you might have more of an activistic personality. Maybe you're real busy and you want to get the most out of it and you want to dig deep. That's good too. Just different intensity. Different intensity. And so that's important to make sure that the intensity matches. So we talked about affinity. We talked about intensity. Another 
factor, honestly, is maturity. Maturity. Spiritual maturity. But it would also include emotional maturity, even mental maturity. Because there could be two people of the same age and on totally different places when it comes to this area of maturity. You know, because of the, some people have, have decided to work on those things. Other people, maybe they didn't. And here, no, so Paul's writing to a group that were believers, but they were at different levels of maturity. And so he's having to kind of come in and talk about maturity issues. He says, stop being mean, bad-tempered, angry. That's all, that's all maturity issues, Christian character, spiritual maturity, quarreling, harsh words, and dislike uh, should, not ha- should have no place in your lives. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God has forgiven you because you belong to Christ. This can actually incapacitate a small platoon if there's a mismatch of maturity. The disparity can be so significant. If somebody has gone through a very painful past, they've been traumatized, uh, maybe they have issues with authority, uh, they haven't figured out how to process uh, some of that stuff and, and, and forgiveness. And what ends up happening is they go and they're part of a small group and then the time and time again, week after week, they can't make progress. Often the group's mission gets derailed and it becomes a focus over and over. That's why we started freedom groups. Freedom groups. So that we can deal with some of that stuff that gets us stuck. And some of you, you need that. If you're new to the church, if you're new to small groups, that's our starting place. That's what we say to everybody. Start with freedom group. Resolve some of your past so that you can experience the full potential of what God wants to call you to. Because you can't. If you still have glasses on, because we all have glasses that we see reality. That's why you can, there can be an accident. And then the, the police officer is asking everybody and they have a totally different view of looking at it. We see things differently. And we see our reality. We see our past through a certain lens. Christ wants to redeem that lens. And he wants to help you see it differently, see it the way he sees it, help you to resolve some of that stuff so you can really move forward. Some of you need to, honestly, some of you need to take it again. I've taken freedom three times. Each time God's done some amazing things in my life, things that I just, honestly, that I had never really resolved from 40 years ago. And so I'm thankful for that, and I invite you to be prayerful about that as well. You know, st- stepping into freedom. We have four freedom groups uh, that, we're, that, we're, that we're doing uh, this semester. And I hope that you would be prayerful about, hey, I want to get unstuck. I want to I get involved in that. And then number four is availability. You see, the truth is you could find a group of people. You know, you show up, you go, hey, I love these people. It's awesome. And they're we're perfectly matched with intensity. It feels good with this area of maturity. I think we've, you know, let's say that we've all taken freedom. But if you don't carve out some time in your schedule, you're not going to go. And so you kind of like, it doesn't matter, you know, those first three. So availability is huge. And so it mentions that in Scripture. It says day by day as they spent a lot of time, much time together in the temple, they broke bread together in different homes. So there is a chunk of time. And we are busy. If I were to ask you, how many of you have three, four hours extra every week that's totally unassigned? Most of you probably would say, well, that's not me. But if you don't create that time, honestly, we do what, you know, we have more control than we think. It ends up being more of a value than anything else. Is that important to me? So certainly I'm hoping to encourage you to embrace that. If you're a small group leader and you're inviting somebody and you're wondering if they're going to come, I can tell you that a red flag is if they say, I'll try. Yeah, it sounds good. Try my best. That's, a, that's not a good sign. <laughs> what you want is somebody who says, I'll do whatever it takes to get there. I'm going to move my schedule. I'm going to move things around. I'm going to get the child care. I'm going to do what I need to do. You can count on me. That's really what you're looking for because that's what it's going to take. Because there's going to be all kinds of things that will cause you to get distracted, like the verse we talked about at the the very first verse. He says, don't get tangled up in all the worldly things. There's a lot of things in this world. 
where we can get distracted and pulled away. So staying focused, being there, getting involved. Honestly, we need that, particularly when we go through difficult times, particularly when we're facing difficult decisions. There's no, there's no a substitute for people that know you, know what you're going through. Sometimes people will come to me, and I know them, you know, I know their name. I've had casual conversations here and there in the hallway or whatever, but I don't really know what they're, what, what, what's happening in their life. And they'll come up and they'll want, like, advice for, like, something big they're going through, you know, some, some financial thing or with their kids or with, with uh, their career or some moral thing. I mean, all kinds of stuff, big stuff. And they go, Andy, what do you think? And I, I don't want to give them bad advice, you know. So I say, well, do you have somebody, you know, that a group of people that, you've, that know you and know your temperament and know your weaknesses and your proclivities and the things that, you know, your, your, your life circumstance And it's a real pain for me. But so often they'll say, no, I don't have anybody like that. No, don't have anybody like that. See, I think we all down deep want the results, of uh, uh, benefits of a small group. It's just, are we willing to pay that price of availability? I'm going to come there. And so often I'll talk to somebody, and it's amazing how many things they do accomplish. Oh, yeah, I'm... I'm I golf every week, and, you know, I'm on, you know, I shop, I do this online, I, you know, I've, I finished all the Netflix series in that, and I'm starting on the next one, and, and then I realize you really do have time, it's just, you know, you're just making decisions, you're, ch- you're making choices, because we make the time for the things that are important, and so I encourage you, make the time, make the time, and we'll do what we can. We try to bend over backwards to help you. We've, we had a guy come up. This was before COVID. And he was, we talked about small groups. He came up and goes, I'd love to be a small group. In fact, be in a small group. In fact, he goes, in fact, I would lead one, but I'm just too busy. And he was. He was in postgraduate school. He was working full time. He had a family. He's a family man with kids. And I mean, the guy was busy. And so we just said, well, do you really want to be in a small group? He goes, Absolutely. We said, well, just tell, tell us a little bit about how your day goes. So he goes, well, I, you know, each day I, I wake up at 5. I'm at the gym by 6. I weight lift for one hour. We go, oh, you don't even have to go any further. There's other people that you can do life with that would want to do that very thing. And you could start building relationship and having that little platoon right there at the gym at 6 in the morning. Would you think so? We said, absolutely. Well, it just so happens that he was lifting that week, and some guy, he's on the bench press, some guy comes up to him and goes, hey, don't you go to Vineyard? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. He goes, oh, man, I just, I just noticed you. He goes, I love, I always work, this is the best time for me to work out. And then he remembered what we said. He goes, you know what, why don't we start a small group here at the gym? He goes, that'd be a great idea. Ended up being one of our biggest groups. It multiplied until we had two groups at the gym, all because somebody said, Yes, yeah, so we'll do our part. I mean, we're going to do anything we can to help facilitate, make it you know, work for you. But in the end, you have to step into it. It says, and let us not hold aloof from our church meetings, as some do. Let us do all we can to help one another's faith. So God wants you in a small group, I believe. I think he's made it very clear. And he wants you in there for your benefit, for you. For you. But... Because that motivates us. But he says, hey, there's another reason too. You're there to help others. You know, there's, we're just geared that way, right? I mean, we're there's kind of a selfish stream that runs through all of our blood, including mine, certainly. And so we bring that to God, say, God, help me to think beyond just what's best for me. That's part of it. We looked at a whole bunch of stuff that what's best for you. But also other people need you. Other people will benefit from you. We'll be okay without you. We'll be better with you. So we invite you to the table. We want you to be part of what we're doing. Okay, let's bow our heads and pray. Would you bow your heads? All heads bowed. If you would also close your eyes. I want to give this as a moment to the Lord to do something for those of you who God is prompting to take your next step. 
we talked about different next steps. Some of you, your next step is freedom group. Kind of resolve some of that stuff out of the past once and for all. Some of you, your next step is just being part of a small group. Maybe you used to be part of one and you got out of the habit. Maybe you've never been in a small group. Your next step. You know, for those of you who are far from God, or maybe you're just feeling distant, God has a word for you. His word is that he loves you, that you're here for a purpose because he wants to communicate that you have uh, a purpose and an assignment, that he, he wants to help you with that. Maybe, you're, maybe you can relate to my story that happened 40 years ago when I came to Christ and nothing really changed. Something changed, I'm telling you, but nothing behaviorally changed. And the story that I didn't share is that it was all along the way God helped me. Certainly a small group, believers were a critical part of that. But it was all along the way God's grace. God's loving me more for, further. But it all began with that prayer when I said yes to God. Some of you, you need to take that step right now. That is your next step, to say yes to God in a prayer. Say, I'm ready. I need your forgiveness. I want your free gift. And if that's you, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. This doesn't mean you're joining Vineyard. It doesn't mean, I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward. I do want you to let me know. Let God know. Say, I'm serious about this. I want to pray that prayer. And if that's you, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask you, just lift your hand up. Say, that's me, Pastor. I'm going to pray with you. Would you do that? That's, yep, bless you. Anybody else in the back? Uh-huh. Anybody else? That's me. Any, yep, I see that. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Why don't you pray this prayer for those of you who raised your hands or you know you need to pray this prayer. Say, God, today, is this, this day is my day. My day to say yes to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. That you love me and you woo me along with grace, not condemnation. Lord, help me to keep my eyes focused on you. You say, God, I give you permission to purify those areas in my life that are going to keep me from living my best life with you. Help me to grow into my full spiritual potential. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give uh, oh, just a, an applause for just those who, who prayed that prayer? For those of you online, let me know about it. There's a way for you to do that. Let me know about what you're going through. We'd love to pray for you. If you prayed with me, let me know on the Connect card. You can just write on there, Andy, I prayed with you. Uh, if any other prayer requests, as you're leaving, there's a, white, a clear box on the, on, the, on the wall. You can just place that in there. It'll go right to our prayer team. Uh, it'll go to me as well. I'd love to pray for you, okay? And then we have our baptism. That's if you want to go and just participate and be an encouragement, you can go there, 65th Street, 65th Street at 2.30. We're going to do the baptisms. It, when you get there, if you go, don't. it's better not to turn toward the ocean. There's actually better parking away from the ocean. It's just a short walking distance. It's on 65th Street. Love to have you there and be part of that. Of course, we have growth track next week. Come prepared. We'll feed you. Watch your kids. It's only one hour long, but it begins you on your path for discovering your purpose. Now, if you'd like to participate in advancing the vision of this church, helping people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference, here's a way that you can do that. Would you stand with me? We're going to go ahead and and uh, just pray and then pass it on to the worship team. We'll close out our service just praising God. Father, thank you, Lord, for your good works, that you are all about bringing people home to you. Lord, thank you that we get to participate that in so many different ways. Lord, I pray your blessing over the small groups as they launch this week. Lord, I pray for all those who take a risk. Lord, be there, meet them, help them. In Jesus' name, amen.